Hey everyone, thanks so much for tuning in to Live Coders Conf today. Uh, thanks to Chef Brent for that amazing intro. I won't bore you with any additional information about myself other than say, uh, if you have any questions during the uh, talk today, 25 minutes isn't quite enough time for a Q&A, so feel free to head over to Twitter and you can find me there at brob, at B-R-O-B. So today we're gonna talk about the CSS future with CSS Grid, but I typically like to start and take a look at how things were in the past and how we've had to do layout up until the revolution that is CSS Grid. Uh, so I've been doing this web design development thing for a long time now. I used to run an agency design team uh, and I typically saw very similar home pages get done over and over and over and over and over again, right? So we had kind of a normal homepage top, right? We'd have this idea of a banner, normal homepage banner, big bold background image in the background, large font text, some description text, some sort of call to action, right? And this usually worked out really, really well for us. You can do a lot of cool design work around it. You can be illustrative, you can be photorealistic, you can play with fonts, you can play with colors, you can do all sorts of really amazing design work. And I've had the pleasure to work with a lot of amazing designers through my career that have really optimized this little design pattern. The problem is you take that to the client and they usually come back with feedback like this. We love this design. It looks amazing. We really, really like it. Oh, but wait a second. Our CEO or, oh, our, our chief product officer or whomever really thinks we need to have four promotional spaces across the top of our homepage. Almost every time they want more things across the top. And you take that back to your design team and you say, all right, we can figure this out. We can figure out how to morph this design that we all really like into something that has four promo spaces. Uh, and typically, doing something like this. You say, I guess, I don't know, we could make it a rotator. You can do some cool animations and stuff. You can make it really slick. Uh, the problem with this isn't in the visual design. The visual design can still be striking amazing. The problem is in the usability of it. Uh, and you go to something like, should I use a carousel.com? And you realize this is actually a very, very bad UX uh, pattern, right? Uh, this, uh, this website, should I use a carousel.com? Shows you all these statistics. Your first slide in a rotator gets fewer conversions than you would if you just had one slide in your rotator, gets almost no conversions, right? So it's really just diluting that space and it's not great for your users, right? So it's always best to do these things in a way that we want our users to convert as much. So we went back to the drawing board. We thought of a few different ways we could do it. And usually we would land on a design pattern that looks like this. It is an A, cool things that our design team wants. We get a, uh, a lot of visual hierarchy ha happening. We get to guide the user's eye through multiple sizes, multiple visuals, that sort of thing. And we get what the, what the uh, client wants. We get four promos at the top. And the cool thing about it is if you already have your visual design set, this takes like five minutes in Photoshop. No big deal. It's really, really easy to just kind of shift things around and make this happen. So where does the problem come in with this? Well, it's when we think about how we're gonna build this. And I'm not gonna lie, I've been able to build this design pattern for like a decade now. We could have done it in floats with the advent of CSS Flexbox, we could do it even easier. Actually building this uh, inside of Flex or inside of floats, what we're doing is we're not thinking about the design, we're thinking about the containers we need to build the design. So this asymmetric promo grid, we, first we need a container around the outside, then we have to figure out this 50-50 split to get things side by side. Then we have to have a container on that right-hand side to handle those two rows, and then we have to handle those two items on the bottom row. So what we actually end up with here is three nested layers of HTML, right? Which is a lot. It looks something like this. It's about 13 lines of HTML. We've got our div class promos. We have a left column, a right column, in that right column, we've got a top promo, we've got columns down below. It's a lot of HTML, it's a lot of nesting. It's even worse if you're using Bootstrap or Foundation or something like that. You end up with like five layers of HTML. And the CSS doesn't get any better for this. I couldn't even fit the CSS on one screen to make this work, right? It's about 31 lines of CSS. We're doing a lot of little hacks to make this work. We're setting um, some right margins that we then have to clear on our last children. We're setting a height of 100% on the promo in the left column to make sure our background image stretches. We're doing a lot of little things. We're declaring display flex like three different times. 
it's really death by a thousand cuts of various things. It makes it hard to maintain. It makes it hard to make responsive. It's just kind of a mess. So let's bring this code into the future and let's talk about how we can take CSS Grid and make this all about the design and the layout and less about the containers. So this is a quote from Rachel Andrew, who's one of the original educators around the grid specification. She has amazing educational information out there for you. And she said, when you're choosing between flex and grid, the thing that you're really kind of thinking about is whether you're working from the content out, letting your content size your layout, or when you want to work from your layout in. If you're using your layout in, you're going to use your grid definition. So let's see the thought process around this asymmetric grid. If you're coming from a bootstrap kind of idea, you'd think, how many columns do I need? Because in grid, we're going to talk about columns and rows. You'd think, all right, I've got a 12-column grid, six columns on the right-hand side, six columns on the left-hand side, and then break those up from there. If you're trying to transition, you might think, I need four columns, right? Two on the left, two on the right. But in grid, we can actually bake our asymmetry directly into our column definition. So we can say there's one column on the left and two on the right. We can also define out our rows and define out how we want those rows to be laid out, which is a first time thing in CSS in the history of web development. So lots of cool things. And the amazing thing about it is I can fit the HTML and the CSS for this on one slide now. It's about half the HTML, about six lines. Um, and the cool thing is this is one layer. We don't have to nest divs anymore to make this work. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, we're at about 22 lines of CSS, and let's take a closer look at that. So first and foremost, we have our promos declaration, and the first thing we have to do is we have to say display grid. If you're familiar with Flexbox, this is the same as saying display colon flex. That's going to make this container a grid context item, and all of its children then become grid items. But then we're actually going to define out our columns. And what we're actually doing here is not defining the columns per se, we're defining the space between what we call grid lines, grid column lines at this point. And we're using a new unit here called the FR unit. It's the fractional space unit. And what this does is it divvies up the available white space amongst all of the columns in this layout. So if you're familiar with flex, this is kind of sort of like a flex grow shrink kind of situation. Um, and then from there, we can also define out our rows. And we're going to use a function in CSS for this called the min max function. It's a very well named function. You set a minimum size and a maximum size for each of our row tracks here. So min max, we say 30 VH, 30 viewport units tall as a minimum size for each of these. And then we say one FR, one fractional unit to allow them to grow at the same rate. So if I would add more text to that uh, promo, both the top and the bottom would grow at the same rate. It allows us to keep a 50-50 split vertically. And from there, we're actually going to define out a grid gap. And what this is going to do is it's going to get rid of all of our margin hacks. We don't have to do margins inside this at all. It creates spacing only in between the tracks that we're using. So this isn't ever gonna push a margin outside of your grid container, it's only ever inside. Fun fact, it is in Firefox and Chrome 84, I think for flex use as well as just gap, which is amazing, it's a topic for another day, but keep your eyes on that as well. And then from this point, what we get to do is for the first time ever, place our content wherever we want to go inside of our grid. So here we've got div class promo, the first child, right? Take that and put it along grid line, grid column line one and span it to grid column line two, that left column. And then take it and stretch it over from grid row line one to grid row line three, spanning two rows. We're gonna do that same thing with the nth child two. We're gonna span it from grid column line two to column line four, spanning two columns there. And then grid row line one, to two spanning just that first row. And then we do the very similar things with three and four. And you can see, I might have lied a little bit and said this might be less confusing than all those hacks. The numbers get a little confusing and I can completely understand if you don't want to have to keep track of how many lines you've got in your grid. I can totally get that. And the great thing is the spec authors, they got that too and we have syntactic sugar. So let's take a look at how that works. First, we're going to display grid, grid template columns, grid template rows, grid, grid gap all over again. And then we're going to use this new property called grid template 
areas. And this is going to allow us to name our areas and then call them by name instead of by line number. Super handy, super readable. So if we look here, we have two sets of quotation marks in this declaration block. The first set of quotation marks equals the first road track, and the second is the second road track. And if we had a third and a fourth, we could have multiple sets of quotation marks. And then inside of that, we label out our column tracks. So in that first row, we have a space called main and then two spaces called second. In that second row, we've got a, a space called main, which stretches that first space over two rows and then a third and a fourth. And then instead of saying grid column, grid row, and placing it along row numbers and, and column numbers, we say grid area and then use those new reserved strings as where we place those. Grid area main puts that item in the main area. Second goes in the second, third, and fourth. And the really cool thing is if you're all about line numbers in terms of length of your CSS, these last six lines or however many that is, five lines, are completely unnecessary actually. Because the way grid works is it wants to place an item into the next available grid cell that it can fit within. And these third and fourth children automatically will fill that third and fourth spot. I like to name them and put the names in there just so six months down the road I know what I'm looking at. But it's really handy if you're all about saving, uh, saving that line uh, length in your code. You can actually kill those and you'll be good to go there as well. So this is like the syntax, this is how you're gonna use it, but what is grid and what am I doing as I call these things out, right? So first and foremost, when you say display grid on an element, what you're doing is you're setting up a grid container. The element that you put display grid on is now a grid container and then every single item inside of it, every element is a grid item. And this includes, and this is kind of a, a gotcha point, this includes pseudo elements. So an after element or a before element, they take part in the grid as well. Super powerful, but you might not expect it and it's something to keep an eye on. And then, like I said, when we build our grid, when we build our columns and our, and our rows, we're using grid lines. So the base unit of a grid is a grid column line or a grid row line. Between two parallel adjacent grid uh, lines, you get a grid track, one row or one column. Between four adjacent intersecting grid lines, you get one grid cell. And then between four uh, non-adjacent intersecting grid lines, you get a grid area. A grid area is not necessarily the same thing as a grid template area. And all this is available on the CSS Tricks uh, primer on grid, just like they've got one for Flexbox, they've got one for grid, and it's really, really good information there. Now, one kind of weird thing that grid does is it has this idea of an explicit grid and an implicit grid. The explicit grid is the grid that we have defined. Right, so two rows, three columns, we define that grid. The implicit grid is what the browser extrapolates to handle additional content. So if you had like a content management driven website with these four promos and forgot to like limit the number of promos the user can put in there, they could add more in there and then what would grid do? Grid will create another row for you and then automatically have that row follow the columns of the ones before. Now you won't have things spanning multiple rows, but it at least will stay lined up with the various things you might expect it to do there, right? So that's the definitions, that's the syntax, but when do you use grid, right? I identify, and this is kind of um, industry-wide accepted, three different use cases for grid. First and foremost, I mentioned with that Rachel Andrew quote a while ago, when you wanna work from your layout in, when you wanna define your layout and then have your content kind of flow throughout it, you want to use grid. When you want to define and place items over two dimensions, over rows and columns or heights and widths, you wanna use grid. You can kind of do some stuff with flex on that, but it's a huge pain as we've seen grids where you wanna be on that. And kind of the minute that you're setting a width, an explicit width on a flex item, you've kind of broken the way that flex wants to work and you probably want grid instead of it. So just some, some guidelines for that. But grid is not a panacea, right? It is not a cure-all. It's not going to be um, what you need to use for all layouts. I actually identify five different times that you should not use grid. That's more than the three that I identified for when to use grid. So first and foremost, content sizing, when you want your content to size your layout, you want flex for that, right? So you have like a navigation, you want those navigation items to kind of size themselves. Go ahead and use flex for that. Flex is what you want for that. Text wrapping, 
floats have long been derided as evil. Floats are not evil. We've just used them for horrible things, right? Floats are great for their intended use, having an image or a video and wrapping text around it. That's the best thing with floats. Floats are still used for that. That's what you want there. I identify when you want to have things micro move, right? So you want to take an element and shift it like two pixels, five pixels. Still want to use something like position relative, position absolute, and have like top right or bottom left, something like that, to actually define out those, those micro movements. When you want to remove an item from the flow of the page, grid's not necessarily going to do that for you. Flex won't do that for you. You still want something like position absolute or something like position fixed to pull it out and have all the content flow up underneath it. And then when you want text or images and stuff to flow between columns, so start at the top left, go down, go to the middle, go down, go to the, uh, the right and go down, grid won't do that. You can hack flex to do it, but it's not a great idea. The CSS multi-column spec is what you want for that. So layout on the web in 2020 and going forward isn't just grid, it's not just flex, it's really everything, right? It's floats and flex and positions and multi-column and grid. So going forward, you wanna use all these to kind of create any layout we can really imagine. They're all now possible in relatively easy stances. But this talk is kind of a lie, and I apologize, I don't like to be a liar, but like grid isn't the future. Grid is very much the present, and you should be using it today if you're not already. And when I talk about using Grid right now, right this second, I get some pushback on it, and it's pushback around this graphic. Can I use.com? We all go and check it when we want to use a new cool feature. Uh, this is actually from a while ago. I need to update this screenshot, but you can see uh, as of like May of last year, we were at 92% globally. We're at a little bit more than that now. Uh, and you can see there's this kind of like puke green uh, uh, color there. And that's for the old Internet Explorer version of it, Internet Explorer 11 and 10. Those are so completely different from the original, from the, the actual specification that they're not even worth like falling back into. So just things to think about there. But how can we use Grid today and not worry about these older browsers? Because we still want them to kind of look okay, right? So we have to ask ourselves a philosophical question. I have a degree in philosophy, so this comes naturally to me. I have to ask this question. Do websites need to look exactly the same in every browser? Dot com. There's a website for this. It gives us the answer, right? The answer is, of course, no, they don't need to look exactly the same. This website will render in Netscape Navigator. It will render the word no in a big font size. It won't have the fancy font. It won't have the transparent filigree. It won't have the repeating background, but it will give you the information you're looking for. So if websites don't need to look exactly the same in every browser, what do they need to be? For my money, they need to be functional. They need to actually load. They need to be navigable. A user should be able to actually click around. They need to be useful, give the user what they're looking for, quick and content equal, because these are older browsers, and so therefore they're on computers that can't upgrade. So we should protect those users as much as we can. How can we protect them and keep it quick and content equal? We don't want to have like a JavaScript fallback, right? The cool thing is we have a new feature in CSS called CSS Feature Queries that allows us, like a media query, to fall into these new specifications. So if our asymmetric grid needs to follow those five key things for working in every browser, does it need to be asymmetric in every browser? Or can it be asymmetric in our grid browsers? For my money, you can have it look like this. It gives us exactly what our client was looking for, four promos at the top. It gives us things that are usable and it, it does it with very little extra code, which means it won't get slower, right? So let's take a look at what the CSS looks like now. The HTML remains the same. It'll still be six lines of HTML, just that one container. And here we say, all right, our promos is going to be display flex. We're going to say justify content space between that gets us our middle margin. And then we're gonna say flex wrap wrap, and that will allow as things uh, expand to go onto new lines. And then from there, we're gonna say each of our promos has a width of 50% minus 0.5 rem. And that's going to allow that space between margin to happen. A min height of 30 VH that's gonna match up with our row tracks. And then a margin on the bottom of one rem and that again spaces things out in the middle. So then from there, we're going to, what I like to say, fall forward, not fall back, fall forward into grid. So it's just like a media query, right? At uh, 
media, or in this case, at supports, and then it takes a property value pair. So in this case, at supports, display, colon, grid. And then inside of these braces, we're gonna give it whatever code we want, only browsers with grid to show. Right, so we're gonna say the promo is gonna reset our width because as it turns out in grid, our percentages are no longer percentage of the parent, they're percentage of the grid area that that item is within. So 50% is not what we want anymore. So width 100%, unset our margins, we don't want the margins anymore, and then we can reset or not the min height auto, right? We don't need that min height because our grid code will take care of that. And then from there, we just write that grid code that we wrote before, display grid, grid template columns, all that good stuff. And it will only render for uh, browsers that support grid. Super handy. It makes it so that grid can be the future, but it can also be used right now for the 93, 92, whatever percentage of browsers support it. And we can still have older browsers ready to go whenever they need it. And we want to do this because it is so powerful. It's very liberating. You can set your designers loose on it and they can do some really amazing stuff. So obviously I've got a few minutes left. I want to tell you where you can learn more about CSS Grid because this is scratching the surface of what it is. I hope that it's given you some, uh, some hope for CSS layout in the future. These are people I love uh, that talk about CSS Grid regularly. Uh, Jen Simmons and Rachel Andrew, they are two of the uh, bigger advocates for Grid. They've been writing about it since it was still in specification mode. Uh, Jen Simmons has been writing about it. Uh, she's the one that actually first turned me on to it. You can find them at those Twitter handles. Uh, Mina Markham and Michelle Barker are two of my favorite authors for anything CSS or front end related. Uh, you can find both of them on Twitter as well. Michelle Barker also runs the CSS in real life account. Uh, and then from there, there's some other good resources, right? You've got Mozilla MDN, right? Developer.mozilla.org. Rachel Andrew actually wrote most of the docs in there for Grid, so you get kind of a twofer on that. CSSGrid.io is a cool uh, free course from West Boss. Mozilla paid him so that he would make a CSS Grid course for free. Uh, Grid by example is a cool like color block layout uh, example made by Rachel Andrew. And then Jen Simmons' website, she has a labs area that shows a whole bunch of different um, examples of kind of experimental designs that she's been working on. And it's just a cool little playground uh, to check to, to kind of check things out and start playing with it. And I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you that I may or may not have my own CSS Grid course. You can find more information at that at practicalcssgrid.com. And I do want to say, since we don't have much time, and I obviously it's hard to take questions over Twitch chat and all that, um, reach out to me on Twitter. I love talking about Grid. I don't get enough of it. So feel free to, uh, to post to Twitter, send me DMs, send me whatever. I will answer your questions about Grid from there. Uh, and I really want to thank you for watching this because I know that this is like a hardcore developer conference and I want to make sure that like CSS Grid is always getting like promoted at those kind of things. Uh, and with that, I'm probably going to go ahead and send this back over to, uh, to Chef Brent to get us in going with the, uh, with the next speaker. Thanks for tuning in, y'all.